millions of Russian barrels disappear from the market. This puts Europe and maybe the world into a deep slowdown, recession, et cetera. OPEC does a massive cut to try to keep prices elevated. This is the so-called doomsday or energy war scenario. Now, that is highly unlikely, but it cannot be discounted to zero. So let's find out what is most likely to happen and bring in Vice President of Analysis at Rystad Energy, Jorge Leon. He and the Rystad team have done great work on this, kind of using a lot of their data here, Jorge, so great stuff. Uh, thank you for joining us. In your mind, which of these scenarios, and again, they're kind of rough outlines, which of those scenarios is the most likely outcome? Thank you, Brian, for having me here. Um, it's always a pleasure. So at this point in time, I wouldn't rule out any of the three scenarios. Things can go south very, very fast, I think. Um, now, one would obviously want to avoid as much as we can the scenario three, the energy war scenario, but things can go south very fast, as I, as I said. One, on one extreme, we have the base case, let's say, or your mild scenario, where it will be painful, but the European Union, the world, will be able to overcome that. And on the other extreme, you have the extreme scenario, of course, which will be extremely painful for the global economy and for consumers around the world. Okay. That said, to your point, there's a lot we don't know. We don't know how Russia is going to react. We don't know how the shipping markets are going to react, et cetera. What do we do know right now? What are sort of the certainties as we go into the weekend? I think there are three certainties. Even though these scenarios show a wide range of uncertainty, I think that we know three things. The first one is that the energy crisis is far from over. Yes, the European Union has made it through this winter, uh, essentially paying a high LNG cost and a mild weather, so we've been very lucky. That's the first certainty. Energy crisis is not over. The second half of uh, next year could be painful. The second certainty, I think, is that Europe especially will have to pay a premium for diversifying imports away from Russia. That's energy security. So energy security comes with a, with a cost. And then finally, the third certainty is that oil and gas prices will remain elevated for the next for the coming months or so. Always when there's a disruption in the market, there is going to be some price action and that's going to affect the global economy and also, again, consumers around the world. It looks like they've agreed on a price cap of $60 for Brent crude. That's about 25 percent below where Brent is right now, Jorge. But with your own data, it's not my data, it's yours. You have seen Russian oil that is actually trading because they have to sell it at a discount below $60 a barrel right now. So do you think this cap, if oil prices kind of stay where they are, is going to do anything? So I think it very much depends on the reaction of, of Russia. Uh, great that we finally have certainty from the European Union about the price cap level uh, just a few hours before the embargo kicks in. But I think there are two pieces of the puzzle that are still uncertain. Russian reaction, they've been very clear saying that they will not sell oil at the, at the discount, um, you know, if, if countries or companies signed up to a, to a price cap, it remains to be seen if they still take that hard stand. And then the second puzzle is what would China and India do in this in this scenario? And this is this is still uncertain. So uh, we expect to see some action in the in the coming months, in the, in the coming days, actually. Well, you used to work at OPEC. I hope that's OK with me saying that. Um, seen you inside the building in Vienna. I'm sad that we're not going to be there on Sunday, but OPEC is still meeting. They're meeting virtually, so a lot of people are like, oh, they're not going to do anything because it's virtual, and maybe they won't do anything. I think they could still have a small cut, but now that we have a price cap, how do you see OPEC reacting to the sanctions and the current price levels? It's a very difficult one for, for OPEC, I think, this time. Uh, as you correctly mentioned, they're meeting on Sunday, and essentially they have to balance all the, the the risks that we see on the market right now. And the first one, we discussed Russia. What is going to be the reaction of Russia? What's going to be the reaction of China and India to the announcement? Still don't know. But on top of that, you have also the uncertainty from the demand side, renewed lockdowns in China, growing COVID cases, and we still don't know what's, what's happening there. So my expectation here and it, that is that OPEC might take a cautious approach on Sunday. We'll wait until the dust settles before taking, taking any decision. We know that Russia has been kind of almost secretly buying up or somebody on behalf of Russia, China perhaps, uh, a bunch of old 
sort of crappy old but, but seaworthy oil tankers to maybe kind of get around some of these sanctions. Uh, we're going to talk more about that, by the way, in our full coverage, which starts on Monday from Europe. That said, how many barrels of oil do you think when the sanctions kick in, the price cap is ratified, as we expect it to be, how many barrels of Russian oil per day do you think may, in the near term, come off the market? If Russia does not sell to anybody obeying to the, to the price cap, we think that around a million barrels per day might be lost in the first quarter of, of next of next year. And that's because of the limitations on the fleet, on the tanker fleet of, of Russia. But as you correctly mentioned, as they gradually build that, that fleet, maybe production will, will start recovering. But in the short term, impact around a million 